Welcome to the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Welcome to another edition of the Vine Resources Podcast Show. I'm David Lawrence and I'm delighted today to have with us Dana Tobak. Dana is the founder and managing director of Hyperoptic. Um, Dana, thanks for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm um, very lucky to be in your office in Hammersmith in central London. Um, Dana, could you share with our listeners uh, a little bit about the company, please? Absolutely. Uh, Hyperoptic was founded in uh, 2011 with the distinct purpose of bringing gigabit fiber to the UK. We focus on urban areas. We're mainly known at the moment for doing large residential blocks, um, but we're expanding our addressable markets uh, to be in a position where we can offer 5 million homes passed by 2025. We're considered an alternative network, Altnet, um, which one early days uh, the Altnets were considered to be just small niche players. And now with our being the leader gigabit provider, essentially we're, we're picking up steam and we're really getting the attention of, of government, of Ofcom, and of course the big telecoms providers here in the UK. Fantastic, and thanks for the introduction. And, and as a customer my, myself of Hyperoptic, I know how fast the service is and I know how desperate I went from uh, one meg in central <laughs> London at, at the time to, to a thousand megs, so uh, amazing really. Um, we're going to jump into the questions if that's okay with you. So I'd love to share with our listeners, you know, now with a company of over 600 employees and growing super fast across the UK, what does a typical day in the business look like for you as the, as the leader? Well, the first thing I would say is there probably is not a typical day um, in the sense that every day is different. Um, obviously, I spend a lot of time meeting with people that can be internal people, external people. Uh, I try to uh, organize my time so there'll be days where I focus on more of the future and the strategy and then days where I'm doing my one-to-ones where I'm meeting with teams or I'm diving into particular you know issues or challenges that we have and doing problem solving and I just really enjoy working across the business to, to help put us on the right trajectory for the future. Fantastic and look thinking about your experience over over the years has anyone influenced you, perhaps even been a mentor to you, and, and impacted you as a leader? And can you share, share that with us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And I know a lot of people tend to reel off um, very famous, well, well-known people um, a, 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 in, in business lingo and having read a book. I, th- I think that for me, you know, my, my past before Hyperoptic, I was at Oracle and I was at Sapient, and I had the, the brilliant opportunities to, to work with some uh, great people. Um, you know, uh, Keith Block, who is now a COO of Salesforce, was my original manager when I joined Hyperoptic. And um, uh, Alan at Sapient was also my uh, key project manager back in the days at Sapient. And of course, now he, he's leading Sapient Publicis. So for me, there's that aspect of people that as I grew my career were, were in the sights for me and, and mentoring me on a day-to-day basis. But one of the key things is having my business partner, my co-founder, Boris Ivanovich. You know, we've been working together for since 2005. And uh, in essence, what works so well about the company and the trajectory that we're on is the balance between, um, you know, we're not the same person, but we are absolutely dedicated to the company. He keeps pushing us, I would say, to be more and more aggressive. I keep making it happen, and, and these are the things that really work. So it, it creates a, a balance in how we're able to move the company in the right direction and make the right decisions and consider whether or not um, the path they're on, the decisions we're on, are, are working well. So it, that's really the balance that works well for us. Now, you've grown from only, I think, two, two employees, in, in, yep. obviously, in the, in, in the start to now, as I said earlier, over, over 600 employees. You know, how are you... Uh, engaging your employees from the top to ensure the success of the business? Yeah, I mean, we, that's, that's something that we challenge ourselves, um, and it's, it's not something that we have perfected yet. We do quarterly what we call pulse surveys. We try to be really good about following up. We um, are also doing more communications across the offices. So we, um, I, I fly out to our Belgrade office uh, once a quarter, if not more often. And basically also trying to get out once a quarter into the field and, and meet with the various management teams and field engineers. We do company meetings as well. And most recently, I started a regular uh, comms update to the entire company so that there it creates that momentum around making sure people are connected to the vision. Fantastic. And, you know, what do you believe? Obviously, the, the industry, and as you mentioned earlier, as a, a hyperoptic being a, a, uh, an alternative to cus- for customers, 
So what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing business leaders today in running the businesses? I think um, the biggest challenge has to be keeping, not just relevant, but um, ensuring that we think about what customers will want in the future and we drive to that. Uh, I think we have to recognize it takes time to evolve a company, it takes time to grow, and in and, and all those things we can't only look at the insights we have today about our current customers, but where do we want to go and, and, and what do we need? The other thing, and, and I think of course you know, Steve Jobs is the perfect example, it's, it's not about the focus group. If you ask people five years ago, do they need a gig, they would have said, no, what are you even talking about? So it's about just making it happen. I mean, we had a lot of naysayers early days that said, oh, well, if you're only offering broadband and telephone, you won't be able to build a, a business. Meanwhile, within a year of going live in a building, you tend to have about 30% take up. So I think we've proven that um, bundles are important for people who don't have differentiators on a broadband product, but we do have a differentiator. We do have great customer service. We have a gig. So people that really fundamentally value connectivity and more and more people are finding themselves on kind of that side of how important is broadband to your day-to-day -day life, the more important it is for them to have great service. And that's what we deliver. So we just try to make an excellent service, we do what we say, and that is the fundamental driver for who we are. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? I think, um, there are a few things that I try to constantly keep in mind as we make decisions across the company and build our strategy. One is, is think of the long term. So what are we trying to achieve in the long term? And recognize that as long as we keep facing in that direction, as long as we make steps in that direction, then we're moving uh, properly. The other thing is top down and bottom up. So it's just as important to have a top down strategy that's logical but you also need to understand the bottom-up details of a company. You need to understand how things actually work. You need to spend time with the people on the ground because it's very easy to build a strategy that isn't deployable. Yeah. or certainly not deployable with, with the current uh, infrastructure process and teams that you have in place. So you need to marry both the detail of creating a business plan and the top-down approach to a strategy. Without doing both those things, one of them will, will fail. If you're only focused on the detail, you won't make it in the right direction. If you're only focused on the top end, you'll fail in your execution. That's great advice there. And, 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 and Donna, what, um, what do you do to help new employees, or what does the business do to help new employees understand the, the culture of the company? So our, our culture is fundamentally on uh, uh, an acronym, uh, RISE, which mm -hmm. is spelled R-I-Z-E which stands for Responsibility, Intelligence, Zeal, and Excellence. And everything we do is around those values of the company. So as part of the hiring process, we talk to people about the importance of, of their behaviors and their commitment to their peers, their managers, and our customers. As part of our induction process, I talk about it with employees and as, as part of our performance management as well. So we really embed it in everything we do. You won't see it on the walls of our company. You won't see it on mouse pads or t-shirts. It's just who we are and what we do, what we anticipate of each other. We have RISE Awards where we really single out people who have demonstrated these values. Yep. These, are, these are both publicly oriented um, in terms of taking feedback from customers and internally oriented. And, and that is what builds our, our culture. We're also trying to do some really neat things in terms of scaling our inductions. For the most part, our inductions up until a couple uh, a few months ago have been relatively individualized as new managers come on board, so we're adding you know, virtual reality, escape room games, videos, so lots of different things to the induction process to not only bring the culture to life, but bring the, the future to life and not take um, doing things the way we used to do them as the right way forward. What's the one mistake uh, you witness leaders making more frequently than others? Um, two, uh, being, being unwilling to admit a mistake. Um, I think the most important thing is, is being able to put your ego aside for a minute and figure out the places where either you as an individual have made a mistake or an organization has, has made a mistake and we have to fix it and you have to learn from it. So the inability to accept uh, a mistake uh, means that the company can improve, the company can get to a better place. So. A lot of people find it difficult to admit um, when something's gone wrong. And one of the things I do with my leadership team is make them stand up in front of their peers and, and talk about 
a mistake that they've made. Some, some people find it easier than others, mm -hmm. um, but it's really important to being a leader is that self-awareness and that, that willingness to accept um, and, and, they, and really face those mistakes and how we need to improve upon our decision making. And, and following that, what have you seen as perhaps a, a behavior or a trait that's de derailed more leaders' careers? Um, I, I think, for the most part, it would be about not looking far enough ahead. So I think what tends to happen in the same way I talked about top-down and bottom-up is people tend to feel comfortable looking out a certain distance, so be it end of the quarter, end of the year, mm -hmm. five years out. And I think the trait of a true leader is being able to shift between those horizons and um, also challenge ourselves to understand which horizon is, is more important. And it's different by company. You know, public companies, uh, the quarterly may be important from the long term where we need to distinguish between the long term goals and the short term goals. For a private company, of course, you have your shareholders, you have your employees, you have the public. So understanding and being able to pick between these different horizons and make logical decisions around which things you're doing for which horizon is, is important. And, and I think if you become focused only on one, which is typically people are in their comfort zone of where they like to think out, um, then again, something will be missed. Now I know back in 2013 you, you uh, had investment from George Soros's uh, quantum fund, uh, so quantum sovereign fund I believe. Um, obviously at that point they could see that, that there was a, the future was bright for, for this industry and this business of course. Um, how do you see now though the next five years, what do you see as the, the, the industry changing and, and also from a, an employee point of view, how do you see that uh, um, affecting your ability to attract and perhaps retain the right talent? Um, so lots of questions yeah. better than one. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Soros invested um, with us in the Quantum Strategic Partners through that fund and in, in 2013. And what's been really amazing about them as a partner is, is they have been strategic. They are involved in the long run, but they also support um, the employees and the management of the company um, in order to reach that goal. So yeah. they're, they're not picking on the specific details of the day-to-day. -day. They want to make sure that we're looking at the long-term and thinking about long-term value. Um, in the last couple of years, we've taken on debt financing as well. So um, we had two years ago, 25 million euros from the European Investment Bank. Last year, it was 100 million from Consortia Four Banks. And, and this year, we've up um, to 250 million with the same four banks, but plus an additional four banks. So clearly, there's a lot of confidence in, in what we're doing. Yeah. And I think that relates to your question about the future and, and how we see that growth and how that relates to, to future talent. I mean, obviously, um, bringing on 250 million pounds gives us a freedom that we didn't have for early days to attract talent, to grow. And the benefit that you have as a growing company is, is you, have, you, you have the opportunity to offer opportunity to people that join. So often in, in large companies where, where there isn't the growth, um, it's very difficult for people to, to learn new skills and, and move ahead. Here with a young company, we welcome people with the right attitude, skill set, et cetera, and we, we train them and give them opportunities to whether it's take on management and leadership positions, whether it's try something new as we try something new. So the opportunity is there. Of course, as we grow and we become a company, I mean, we announced that we're going to be adding a, a, at least a 1,000 engineers to the pool. So we're growing as a company. And with that, we need to also bring in people who have experience in, in running large companies. And the benefit is that with the success that we've had, with the excitement of our, our goals and our future and the shareholders that we have on board, uh, it's actually been um, fairly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's just amazing how many people have been interested in, in, mm -hmm. in joining us. So I think early days, with, when hyperoptic wasn't known, it's more difficult, I think, to attract people who see themselves as, as larger company people and very experienced. Um, as we grow, we're able to do that. And, and we see some amazing talent joining the organization, building, augmenting what we're doing, and giving us the opportunity to get on that aggressive trajectory that we've, we've set ourselves as a target. Fantastic. And look, if you were looking back now uh, and giving your 20-year-old self advice, and uh, hindsight's always a wonderful thing, of course, but um, if you were giving yourself advice, 
What's the one thing that you would tell yourself now? Hmm. Um, I think what was interesting about my career growth from 20 to today is that I never uh, actually had a, a plan in the sense of I never sat down and said, this is what I want to be doing in five years. So I was pretty pleased that I never got that question on in, in the interview that I was in. Um, and, and for me, it's been about just doing the best job that I can do, um, always keeping a lookout for opportunity and actually getting excited by the big challenges. Um, when Boris and I had the chat back in 2004 about um, my running a broadband company, I mean, I had never run, uh, started a company on my own at that point, and I, I certainly was not a, a broadband expert by any stretch, but I, I took the leap. Um, the other thing which has worked so well is um, keeping networks together. I think um, it's, it sounds obvious, and I don't mean networking for the sake of building up a thousand people in your LinkedIn profile. I mean truly connecting with people and, and keeping those connections over time and valuing you know, the teams and the contributions that you've made and the professional experiences that you've had, maybe even personal experiences. And that has always uh, amazed me and, and, and served me well. I mean, Boris and I went to university together. Our former chief sales officer was at university with us. And you know, if you had told us those numbers of years ago that we would, in fact, be, be running a broadband company together, we, we, that would have just been completely unknown. So I, I don't have any specific advice other than to say there's a lot of things that I felt my general attitude brought that put me in the position I am today, which is take advantage of opportunity, don't, br don't burn bridges, um, and, and just keep your eyes open. That's why there's some great advice there. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sure there's some nuggets that have come in from that conversation I could hear myself. Dana, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. I'm, I'm really grateful for your time. What's the best way for people, if they want to find out more about Hyper Optic or uh, connect with you, what's the best way they can get in touch? Well, I would say if it's about hyperoptic, go to the website, um, look out at what, what's happening in Google, sign up regis to register your interest. We send out updates all the time. Just for me personally, reach out on, on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.